you know, this would make a pretty good game. Super Smash Brothers, a franchise that needs no introduction, even though I'm about to give it one. A crossover fighting game featuring not just Nintendo properties, but amazing characters from hundreds of different games. Smash is a celebration of gaming, whether you play it in tense tournament brackets or half paying attention while drunk at a party. It might surprise you that, being the juggernaut it is now, Smash's beginnings were unbelievably shaky. There's probably a universe or two out there where the game just never got made. Fortunately, though, we live in the blessed timeline. So, let's talk about the complete history of Super Smash Bros. It's the mid-1990s, and a young Masahiro Sakurai heads to an arcade to do some gaming. He plops down at a King of Fighters 95 cabinet and absolutely destroys his opponent. He takes a look over, and he sees a couple out, with the novice girlfriend currently playing and taking that out. He felt so bad that he was performing intricate combos on this very clear beginner, and he feared that she would never have an interest in fighting games going forward. This experience really spoke to Sakurai. At this point in his career, he had already created the Kirby series, a platform game designed specifically for beginners, but which offered harder challenge options for more experienced players. So his gears started turning, and he began to think about applying this same principle to fighting games finding a balance between an easy and fun game for beginners, while also offering something that could keep experienced players engaged and coming back as well. The big trouble with fighting games is that they have such a high barrier of entry. Learning the game itself, finding a character you may be interested in, and then memorizing the inputs for moves, it's all very daunting for a new player. Sakurai also felt that the gameplay hits a certain point where your skill level becomes irrelevant. A player can get one hit and convert that into a crazy amount of damage simply because they've memorized guaranteed combo strings. The other player just kind of has to sit there and let it happen to them. Skilled fighting game players would of course say that learning how to get that first hit and converting to damage is an indicator of skill, but either way, Sakurai felt that this really discouraged new players. So, to address these issues, Sakurai wanted to make what he called the antithesis of fighting games. Rather than raw memorization and execution of inputs, he wanted there to be more improvisation and flexibility with the gameplay. The first major change is that the actual stages became more than just flat arenas. Each had their own sizes, platform layouts, and attributes that made stage choice much more than a simple change in aesthetics. The characters were also much more agile and had the ability to double jump, so stages were designed around these abilities. Additionally, falling off the stage or being hit far enough would result in a KO, the primary way to defeat your opponent. And along with this, he did away with a standard health bar, opting instead for the famous damage percent meter. While this is now a staple in modern day, back then this was kind of a confusing idea. The more damage you take, the higher your percent, and higher percents result in further knockback. This means that even if your opponent executes a great combo and gets a lot of damage on you, you still have the opportunity to survive and continue playing, or even make a comeback. Sakurai also came up with an alternative to the complicated input combinations that were a major part of traditional fighting games. Instead, he came up with the smash input concept. Rather than executing a complicated pattern for an attack, he thought about how the speed and direction of an input could be used to implement a different move. And just like that, the award-winning formula was born. Congratulations, it's a boy! Sakurai worked alongside Satoru Iwata, the then president of game studio HAL Laboratory, to create a prototype for this game to present to Nintendo. During this time, the focus of the game shifted away from exclusive one-on-one -on -one matches, which is typical for fighting games, and instead took on the role of a four-player battle royale. Not only would this take advantage of the four controller ports found on the Nintendo 64, but it allowed players to change up the rules to play how they wanted, whether in a casual party game style or a more traditional one-on-one -on -one tournament style. This developed prototype was named Dragon King The Fighting Game, and it was well received when they finally showed it off. It absolutely had the skeleton for what Smash would eventually become, even though it really just used a bunch of mannequins. For decades, some still low-quality images were all we had of this prototype. But in 2022, Sakurai finally revealed footage of the prototype on his YouTube channel for the very first time. After showing Dragon King to Nintendo and receiving high praise for it, Sakurai basically just had to wait for an opportunity to fully make the game, with staff at HAL Laboratory currently occupied with other projects. But luckily, that opportunity struck. 
During all of this, Nintendo was working on the disc-based peripheral for the Nintendo 64, the 64DD, and most of their development efforts were focused on games specifically for it. But upon its release in Japan, the peripheral was an immediate commercial failure, and Nintendo was scrambling to recover from this. Some of the planned 64DD games were reworked into regular N64 games, others were shelved for later release, and some were just completely scrapped. So Nintendo was looking for any game that would have a quick turnaround, and Sakurai's fighting game prototype fit the bill perfectly. However, Sakurai had some reservations about the direction to take the game. A big hurdle that fighting games have is that they instantly throw a dozen brand new characters at you, which can really be overwhelming. Even if you manage to see a character you like purely based on design, you may not mesh with their moveset. This problem isn't as big a deal in arcades, because you can often walk up, see someone else playing, and get an idea of a character or two just by watching over their shoulder. But for home games, it can just be a lot all at once. To circumvent this issue, Sakurai avoided using original characters, and instead just yoinked Nintendo's characters to use as fighters. There have actually been conflicting reports about whether this was done with or without Nintendo's permission. A common story is that Nintendo actually rejected the idea, but Satoru Iwata never told Sakurai, and a more polished prototype using the Nintendo characters was again presented, finally convincing Nintendo to move forward. Other stories say that they just had Nintendo's permission from the jump. Regardless of the truth of this, the Nintendo crossover aspect ultimately did move forward. The starting roster for this game was, even for the time, exactly who you'd expect. Mario, Nintendo's poster boy in both the 2D and 3D eras, was always going to be in. Donkey Kong, who had previously tapered off in popularity, had a monumental revival thanks to Rareware and the Donkey Kong Country and Donkey Kong 64 games. Link from the Zelda series, a popular franchise for Nintendo, but one which soared to its highest point with Ocarina of Time, which this fighter is based on. Samus from Metroid, an incredibly popular series despite having only three entries at the time, no new games in years, and which had no presence on the N64. Yoshi, who started as Mario's companion in Super Mario World, but who since became a fully-fledged character in his own right. Kirby, Sakurai's baby. I have a feeling he would have ended up in the game even if Kirby as a series failed, but fortunately this wasn't the case, Kirby was just unbelievably popular. Fox from Star Fox, another incredibly popular series that had fans dying for more. And they're still dying all these years later. And Pikachu. It's weird to think, but Pokemon was relatively new during the game's development, so the inclusion of a Pokemon really solidified its status as a Nintendo mainstay at the time. It was certainly already on its way to becoming the media juggernaut that it is today, but it had only been released for three years in Japan and just one year in America at the time of Smash 64's release. And what's a fighting game without some secret, unlockable characters? The first entry teases four secret characters in the opening of the game, and you will never guess who they are. You can't fool me, that's just green Mario! Luigi, a clone of Mario with some slightly tweaked properties. Ness from Earthbound. Of all the fighters, Ness is definitely the most obscure, with many only discovering his game because of his presence in Smash rather than the other way around. But in the current year, it's just really hard to picture Smash without Ness. Captain Falcon from the F-Zero series, a quite popular racing game developed by Nintendo. And Jigglypuff. Yeah, Jigglypuff is here too. Most of the unlockable characters in the game were included because of how quickly they could be created. Luigi is a clone of Mario, Jigglypuff is a deviation from Kirby's moveset, and Captain Falcon largely seems to come from the Dragon King prototype characters, having a similar build and similar moves. Ness is really the only character who seems like a true, full character, and he's probably unlockable just to make the starting roster and unlockable roster nice round numbers. The game consisting of Nintendo characters carried many benefits. Rather than having to market a fighting game from scratch, they had the benefit of just saying, play as Mario and beat the shit out of Donkey Kong. Along with this, the movesets themselves wouldn't have to be created out of thin air. Even in the 90s, these characters had multiple games to pull inspiration from, and movesets could easily be created out of this source material. It was during this point of development that the idea of special moves were also created. Dragon King didn't have any kind of unique special moves for the blank characters, but special moves are a big part of fighting games. But rather than use those complicated fighting game inputs, Sakurai looked at that magical B button. Using the directional input from the smash attack mechanic, the B button became the special move button, and inputting a different direction, or nothing at all, while pressing B would change what type of move came out. And so, in 1999, Nintendo's new funky experiment was released, Super Smash Brothers. 
Internally, there was a sort of split about how well they thought this game would do. Developers loved the game. It played incredibly well, and the idea of a Nintendo crossover really excited them. However, the sales team weren't so sure. They were worried that players would have issues with attacking their favorite Nintendo characters. I think the opening to this game was probably a way to put these concerns at ease. It shows that these characters in Smash are meant to just be toys, and that these fights take place in a kid's imagination. It's not actually the real Mario and Link. But regardless of this, Nintendo really pushed the game. In 1999, Nintendo of America put on an event at a theme park in Las Vegas, titled the Super Smash Bros. Slam Fest 99, which featured mascot costumes of different Nintendo characters performing in a wrestling match and also had demo kiosks for attendees to try out. The wrestling match was also available for streaming for a while after the actual event, but it was taken down and to this day is lost media. These costumes did, however, make a comeback, being featured in the well-known commercial for Smash 64 in the US, using the similar concept of mascots beating each other up. I mean, what better way to sell the game than to just beat the shit out of Donkey Kong? However, despite the sales team being hesitant about the game, it just printed money, becoming the fifth best-selling game for the entire Nintendo 64. And when you consider it released only two years before the next console was released, that really is something. It really seemed like Smash found a winning formula. Being able to tweak the rules to the game to play how you like made it widely accessible to everyone's style of play. In addition to the unique gameplay mechanics, other elements were included that would lean this game more toward the party game aspect. Stages included a variety of hazards and mechanics, from warping in pipes to dangerous acid to big scary wind. Items were also added to the game, which provided a variety of effects. Some can be used to fight, some kinda just get in the way, and some can heal you up. And there are the Pokeballs, which will summon a random Pokemon onto the field to interfere with the match. The stage pool left a lot to be desired, though. There are only nine total stages, so the game at a certain point can feel a little monotonous. There just isn't enough variety. And just like any fighting game, there is some content available if you're playing by yourself. One player game sends you down a set of fights in a variety of different setups. You fight 1v1s, team battles, even a giant Donkey Kong. To break up the fights, there are also some bonus stages. Break the targets and board the platforms, which are self-explanatory. These modes are also available separately so you can try to get the fastest time possible. You finish off one player mode against Metal Mario, followed by the Fighting Polygon Team, a mysterious group of polygons that totally aren't just the fighters reskinned. And lastly, you take on Master Hand, a disembodied hand that is probably the kid playing with his Nintendo toys. The thing that sucks about one player mode is that it never changes. You always start out against Link, fight the Kirby team, fight giant Donkey Kong, and always on the same stages. Like, I understand the roster is small, so it was kind of limiting, but it's a shame because being the same every time really makes it dull after like three playthroughs. Ultimately, Smash 64 was a success, but you can really tell it's the first in the series. The gameplay is fine. I mean, it's Smash, you'll have fun, but the characters are incredibly stiff, and there's just something a tad awkward about the game. Don't get me wrong, I love Smash 64, but it's definitely not as fine-tuned as the other entries. It's almost like you can tell this was a game that needed a really quick turnaround. This is emphasized even more by the amount of content in the game, which just isn't a lot. Naturally, Smash is mostly about the fun you can have with your friends, but it would have been nice to see some extra stuff to do. This must have been on Sakurai's mind as well, because almost immediately after Smash 64's release, he began mentally crafting a follow-up. The concept behind this follow-up was essentially Smash 64, but everything is better. Better visuals, gameplay, music, everything was going to top what was done in the original. This vision maintained all the way through development, to the point that in Japan, the game is literally just titled Super Smash Bros. Deluxe. And Sakurai even got the fans involved. In 1999, the Smash Bros. website opened up a questionnaire that asked for players' favorite Smash 64 characters, but also who they would like to see in a hypothetical sequel, which almost certainly influenced some of the picks for the new game. Rather infamously, Melee had an almost unreasonable development cycle of just 13 months, and Sakurai recalls that he had a destructive lifestyle during this time. He was really feeling the pressure to deliver on this sequel. The first game was sort of an experiment, where there were no real expectations for the game's success. Now that all eyes were on him, and people would be expecting a quality product, he felt the pressure to live up to that demand. To take advantage of the GameCube's hardware, and Nintendo finally using discs instead of cartridges, Sakurai wanted to introduce two new features to the game. The first was a full motion video opening, which is crazy to think about. 
They're so standard nowadays, but back then consoles were simply not powerful enough to accomplish this. The other feature was including fully orchestrated musical tracks, thanks to streaming playback. The final game didn't end up being fully orchestrated, but it had orchestra pieces alongside digital songs as well. And so, E3 2001 rolled around, and so did the big reveal, the Nintendo GameCube. And what game did they choose to debut the GameCube with? The follow-up to Smash 64 was introduced, officially revealed to be titled Super Smash Bros. Melee. If there was any doubt of the levels of success Smash 64 had, they were eliminated with this reveal. It's one thing for a game to do well, but for Smash to go from a weird experiment to the first thing they show off for the GameCube? That's pretty big. The cinematic opening that Sakurai storyboarded was even used as the trailer for the game, showing off both new and old characters, as well as giving some glimpses at how the game would actually play. The difference between Smash 64 and Melee's graphics really showed off the huge leaps that the GameCube made. Going from these super blocky, pixely models into something so detailed and smooth is just truly night and day. In winter 2001, Super Smash Bros. Melee was officially released in Japan and North America, with Europe getting the game the following spring. And Sakurai really lived up to his goal of Smash 64, but better. The game overall has a much better feel. The controls are tighter, characters move quicker, and the speed of everything in the game is generally ramped up. There are also brand new additions to the game, with the biggest being the addition of a new special move for every character. In 64, there were only up, down, and neutral specials, and Melee adds a side special move, giving everyone a total of four. Also added are up throws and down throws, doubling the directions that you can chuck an enemy. Characters can also now do a dodge in place and an air dodge, adding to the pool of defensive options across the board. There are other smaller additions too, like wall jumping, angling moves, and charge smash attacks, as well as character-specific changes. The game just really got a huge overhaul under the hood. On top of that, all 12 characters from Smash 64 return. But on top of those 12, 14 more characters were also added, more than doubling the roster size from 64. Peach and Bowser were both added, the obvious next choices for the Mario series, and the top two winners from the Smash website's poll. Bowser really just plays into the big dinosaur guy trope, but Peach's moveset takes inspiration from her first playable appearance in Super Mario Bros. 2, with the ability to float and pull up turnips. The Ice Climbers, a duo character representing the classic NES days, Several candidates were considered to fulfill this category, but Ice Climber was the character who actually made the cut. Playing as two climbers at once was born out of the Ice Climber game, where two players could scale a mountain simultaneously. New from the Zelda series is a two-in-one fighter, Princess Zelda and her alter ego, Sheik, from Ocarina of Time. Each has their own unique movesets and are capable of transforming back and forth with their down special, spoilers be damned. Marth from the Fire Emblem series. Marth was actually considered for the roster in Smash 64, but was scrapped as a result of time constraints. Marth was also initially going to appear exclusively in the Japanese versions of Melee, due to Fire Emblem at the time being exclusive to Japan, but luckily this was decided against. Mewtwo was also added, presumably as a pseudo-villain for the Pokemon series. Already a popular Pokemon, he served as the antagonist for the first Pokemon movie, causing his popularity to skyrocket and Mr. Game & Watch, a unique mashup from the LCD Game & Watch line, pulling his attacks from different actions from those games. To match the LCD games, he's also completely flat, and to this day is one of the most unique characters in all of Smash. Those are all of the unique newcomers for Melee, however to help pad out the roster without devoting too many resources, Sakurai once again opted to include clone characters. Dr. Mario, a clone of Mario, based on his appearance from the Dr. Mario puzzle games. Young Link, a clone of Link. This character choice is really clever because it really helps highlight Link's appearance in Ocarina of Time, with time travel resulting in two ages for Link, one adult and one young. Ganondorf, a super weird one based on Captain Falcon. Ganondorf was also highly requested on the Smash 2 poll thanks to his appearance in Ocarina of Time, so this was a quick way to include him thanks to Captain Falcon having a similar build. The amount of work was also considerably sped up thanks to the fact that his model comes from a tech demo shown off for the GameCube at Space World 2000. He's really just a quick and dirty character. Falco is a clone of Fox, his fellow Team Star Fox member. Falco also got some of Fox's old attributes, like some of his stats and a slower laser that causes hits done. Pichu, the pre-evolution of Pikachu, so appropriately, a clone of Pikachu. Pichu has a fun little gimmick where any moves that use electricity actually deal some self-damage, inspired by its Pokedex entries and appearances in the anime where it can damage itself by using its electricity. 
And finally, Roy, a clone of Marth. Roy's game was being developed at the same time as Melee, so it was sort of perfect timing to include him. His game actually ended up coming out after Melee, so Roy ended up first appearing in any video game ever in Melee. The stage choice in this game is also greatly improved, going from 9 in Smash 64 to 29 in Melee. Only three of these are returning from 64, Dreamland, Yoshi Story, and Congo Jungle. Other stages from 64 received spiritual successors. Sector Z became Corneria, Planet Zebes became Brinstar, and there's a new Peach's Castle and Mushroom Kingdom. And the all-new stages really ramp up the variety. Nearly every universe in the game has two stages to pick from. There's really something for everyone here, from the wacky stages with lots of hazards, moving platforms, or car accidents, to more neutral stages that let you focus on just the fight. It took the play-how-you-want formula and just really ran with it. And that's especially clear with Special Melee, a whole big list of different ways to play a versus match, like Giant, Slow-Mo, and Invisible. There's also Tourney Mode, which absolutely nobody on the planet uses to operate tourneys. Fortunately, this game really expands on what you can do as just a single player. 64's one-player mode became Classic Mode, and the same general idea applies a series of fights against single fighters, teams, or hordes, with different mini-games in between. The great thing about this classic mode, though, is that everything is randomized, which really helps keep things fresh. A run follows the same general flow every time, but the characters and stages fought are always different. The boss of this mode is still Master Hand, but joining him on certain difficulties is a boss new to the series, Master Hand's opposite, Crazy Hand, a stronger but more erratic hand that fights alongside Master Hand, occasionally doing team-up attacks. There's also a brand new adventure mode. Rather than being just a string of fights, the mode takes you through different Nintendo worlds. You travel through the Mushroom Kingdom, traverse a Zelda-inspired underground maze, escape an exploding Zebes like in Metroid. Throughout this are fights against characters from these series, but the goal is to make it feel more connected. The end of Adventure Mode has you take on a giant Bowser, but once you've seemingly defeated Bowser, his trophy rises back up and shatters, revealing his all-new crazy transformation, Giga Bowser. This is a totally Smash original concept, basically giving Bowser a Super Saiyan upgrade with his moves all doing insane damage. Defeating Giga Bowser properly ends Adventure Mode, and your journey is finished. Personally, I respect the effort put into Adventure Mode, but it feels like it kinda loses steam about halfway through. You start out going through these huge, cool custom maps based on Nintendo series, but by the end, it's kinda just fights, almost like Smash 64's one-player game. It's certainly a cool concept, I just wish they did a little more with it. I will say though, of all the faceless fighting teams in the Smash series, Melee's fighting wireframes are probably my favorite. They just, they look so cool. You also get a nice reward when you unlock all of the fighters, a brand new mode called All-Star Mode. In this mode, you take on every single character on the roster, starting with one-on-ones before going into three- and four-player free-for-alls. You retain all damage as you progress, but are given healing items to use strategically. I really love this mode. Cranking up the difficulty and seeing how far you can make it is just so much fun. We also have an all-new Stadium mode for some minigames. Break the Targets makes a return, with unique maps for every fighter in the game, and an absolutely banging song to go with it. Board the Platforms from the first game isn't here anymore, but we do have two new modes. The first is Home Run Contest, where you attack and rack up damage on a sandbag, then hit it with the Home Run Bat item to see how far you can get it. I have always been so bad at this, and seeing the world records for each character just makes it all the more insane that it's doable, because I get like 2 meters every time. The other new mode is Multi-Man Melee, featuring the fighting wireframes. This mode essentially has you defeating hordes of enemies, which is always good fun. But perhaps the biggest addition to single player is Event Mode. These events put you in Smash battles, but they generally have themes that they follow, with different goals in mind, and they can have a pretty wide range. Some follow a theme for a specific character, like Link fighting Dark Link, or a theme for multiple characters, like Girl Power defeating the female fighters. Others give you a more focused goal, like defeat the enemy using only Pokeballs or defend this Yoshi egg from getting broken. The most infamous event by far, though, is the final event, number 51, The Showdown. This pits you against a Ganondorf, Mewtwo, and Giga Bowser, all with three stocks. It's hard enough defeating Giga Bowser once, but three times, plus two other fighters? This event drove me crazy as a kid, and even to this day, it gives me trouble, even when I'm better at Smash than I was as a kid. But the cherry on top of all of this content, sprinkled throughout almost every mode, are the trophies. These were created as a solution to the lack of content found in Smash 64, and it seems to be an evolution of the toy concept in that game. 
This time around, the fighters are little trophies that come to life to fight each other, which is a bit more ambiguous than the kid playing with his toys narrative. Naturally, all of the fighters have their own little collectible, but characters from the fighter series and even characters from random Nintendo series are included. This is a great way to expand the amount of content and series represented outside of just the fighters, and this idea would, for better or worse, be integral to the Smash series to this very day. Outside of finding trophies while playing through other modes, the trophy menu also has a lottery, which allows you to use coins collected in single player to redeem trophies in hopes that you'll get that one that you're missing. Or you can view all of the trophies in the gallery in this little room, which almost foreshadows the Smash series in a way. The evolution from Smash 64 to Melee is frankly kind of unbelievable, especially when you consider there are only two years between their release dates. Smash 64 holds a special title, being the first in the series, the start of it all. But to me, Melee is where Smash Bros really became Smash Bros. So many elements in the series moving forward can find their roots in Melee. Melee also just feels the best to play. Speeding the game up, offering tighter controls, not to mention a better controller, Melee is the Smash game that I feel gives you the best control of your character. And of course, there's the elephant in the room, the competitive scene. While many players would move forward with the sequels in the series, a core community continues to play Melee to this day. Advanced techniques, both intended and unintended, turn Melee from a fun party game to a fast-paced, intense, competitive esport. Over 20 years later, Melee continues to grow. Bigger tournaments, more people watching. Every day, more and more people are being introduced to the world of competitive Melee, a game that I find unbelievably beautiful. Even Sakurai has stated that Melee is definitely the sharpest entry in terms of gameplay speed and control. And remembering his goal of making Melee do everything better, I'd say he absolutely met and exceeded those expectations. The problem is, where does the series go from here?